Hi, my name is Brian Harden with New Ways to Evolve, Change, and Grow. Today's guest is Victoria Vesnet. Victoria Vesnet is an artist and professor at the UCLA Department of Design Media Arts and director of the Art Sci Center at the School of Arts and California Nanosystems Institute. She is an amazing artist that mixes a combination of art and science together. So Victoria challenges you to expand your mind and connect to your feelings. So welcome Victoria to the show. Hello. Hi there. So could you tell us some new and exciting things that are going on in your life that, uh, that you've got going? Well, I think we're all in it together, first of all. I'm trying to figure out how to take my creative work, the work I do in the educational field, as a parent and uh, in larger society and how to connect all the dots. Actually, I feel almost like everything was building up to this point for many of us, and especially those of us who worked in the media world on the fringes of the established art world that became more and more about serving the elite society, the 1%, and, uh, one solitary object that you know the value goes up and up and you go to these museum openings and it's just something that I just could not relate to. So a whole, a whole community of artists uh, working in media, music and performance, really on the fringes, uh, has been growing consistently and I was one of the early um, media artists or artists working with technology and music and sound uh, to set up media arts department first in, in the art department at UCSB and then I came to UCLA. Now they're all over the place. So from that point where there was just a handful of us and there was no such thing really, we, we just DIY learned. Um, there's many, many, which means thousands of students are coming out who are thinking more comprehensively, who are thinking more in relation how to connect the dots. And we have been struggling to fit into these categories that don't quite fit. Uh, so to suddenly have it all break down uh, is quite a moment. I, I totally am sensitive and uh, pay attention to the fact that I'm in a privileged position, as many around me are, but at the same time, I feel and I sense the heaviness from so much suffering and so much uh, pain and death. Uh, I think any artist that sensitive feels that. So to create uh, environments and spaces and artworks and music that actually reach out to this energy field and try to lift it up, to make it easier, number one. Number two, to use the medium. So uh, even Zoom, how do you use it in a way that's not just you know, the little windows and conversations? How do you take it to another level? Uh, how do you connect physical spaces to the virtual spaces and uh, reclaim some of the senses that are lost in this transition? I think we're all trying to do that, but many of us have been there. And so the jump for me particularly is easy in the sense of the connectivity and not trying to categorize what we're doing. And so I'm actually thinking of projects and ways to do this. And a lot of my projects that have been in the works actually make more sense in this environment. It always was a little bit of a acrobatics to squeeze it into a museum or a gallery space. And I, always thought of how do you expand it out? How do you get out of the walls? How do you make it accessible to a larger public and not just to the few? That's good. I mean, it, it's, it's a new beginning. I think we have uh, this small window uh, to really think of alternative ways after Corona. So there's BC before Corona and AC after Corona. <laughs> We're referring to it that way now. So. BC had many issues because we were so locked into the 19th, 20th century systems and structures. And this is now 21st century. It's a new cycle. It's nature basically saying stop. 
And it's an amazing moment because it's also next in the next few days, 50 years since uh, Earth Day was established. Um, and this was a year after we landed on the moon. And in 1969, the year of the love, um, we actually looked at our planet for the first time. And the landing of the moon is what got us to think of the Earth and to think of planetary citizenship and what it means to live on a planet in a larger space. And then uh, 50 years later, last year, in 2019, China landed on the other side of the moon, which was an amazing technological feat. It was downplayed here, uh, but scientists who I know and, uh, and to relate with actually have taken aback at what it means. Suddenly you have this yin and yang situation where for all these years, the West was kind of dominating the moon, if you will. Um, and now you have this other thing happening from the East, from China. And then the full cycle of the zodiac, Chinese zodiac happens and we're now at the year of the rat. And the year of the rat, the metal rat, uh, actually started with this virus just going. So when everybody was celebrating, basically in China, they started moving like crazy. And uh, the source of that virus is the wild animal market, which is really, really significant to me. Uh, next door to it is a biotechnology lab. There's speculations whether this was related or not. Actually, to me, that's less uh, interesting than to think of what is it that the animals are trying to tell us. And this relates to a project that I was working on for 12 years now, so exactly at the beginning of the cycle and now, uh, Hogs Zodiac with Siddharth Ramakrishnan. He's uh, from India originally, and we met when he was a postdoc at UCLA in neuroscience. So just to take it back to the moment where this, you can see how a seed happens that just wants to grow. So it's, it was this side project that just kept wanting to happen. And it was happening from friendship because we really liked talking to each other and hanging out. And I would ask him questions like, what would you do if you had no restrictions about budgets, laboratories, professors, anything as a scientist, what would you do? Without hesitation, he would say, Hugs, hugs gene. I would just really look into that. Sounds cool, what is it? It's the homeobox gene. It's the gene that determines how we all look. Tell me more. Well, at the very beginning of life, whether it's a worm or an elephant or any living creature, including us, this gene kind of decides how you're shaped. And I just was blown away with that idea. So let's do something with it. Let's make a project. He's like, yeah, let's do it. But then what do you do with every single creature? Like, how, do you, how do you put this message out? On the other hand, I felt it was such an important message to show that we're part of this larger system, that in all this diversity, we're actually the same. And we all start from this small seed that ends up being this complexity. And then we disappear into dust. And to have this cycle shown was really bugging me. How do we do this? I was learning more and more about the hogs. We talked about it. And then I, my daughter decided that she was going to go to China to study Mandarin and Chinese culture. So at the same time, an invitation came to do an exhibition there. It was some random exhibition, to be honest. If really, normally, I would have said no. But my daughter's there, so, so yes. And then I thought, well, what I like doing with these kind of low profile exhibitions is test out a new idea. And in the airplane, I thought, wow, maybe the Chinese zodiac is the way to go as a framework because we relate to those animals. And I suggested it to Siddharth, he thought it was a very cool idea. Then we started meditating on the zodiac outside of astrology and the superstitious bits, but more about Chinese uh, myths and particularly Chinese medicine, how it relates to the signs. 
And then we started thinking, well, let's reframe the zodiac to also show these animals in laboratories. So if you look at the zodiac, um, you, you point to different parts of it. Most are actually used in experiments, in laboratory experiments. There's only a few, the, the dragon, the rooster, even the snake that used to be less, now it's very much used for venom, etc. So it started growing, and long story short, we went through many iterations of playing. It, was, it started technologically, where it was a kind of an interactive piece, and then it slowly morphed into dinner parties. Mostly because when we were in Taiwan and Hong Kong, and we were sitting at this round table with these petri dishes with different herbs that are for each animal, everybody felt like we were going to have a dinner because we were on this round table that we use actually the dinner table. So we started introducing a little bit into it and then more and more and it kept going and it was kind of a fun way to have a dinner where you could have deeper discussions as your animal. So for instance, what animal are you? Yes. Um, yes. And so I am 1963, which is... 63 would be, I think, tiger. Tiger. Is it? Um, I can't tell. 62 is tiger. So 63 is rabbit. I'm a little rabbit. You're a rabbit like Jim. Uh, uh, Jim's a rabbit? Jim's a rabbit. So for instance, if you click on rabbit now, and you go down... There you go. I'll just describe it a little bit. If you see the center, you actually don't see the picture of the rabbit. You see the, the drawing that I did of the embryo of a rabbit. And they're all embryos that are actually quite sim similar because embryo is at the point where the hox starts deciding how you shape yourself. And then if you click on science on the top left, you'll see all the different things that uh, that rabbits are used for in science. And for instance, Louis Pasteur used rabbits to develop his rabbit. And right now in the year of the rat, um, we're very much all over the world in full mode trying to figure out, the scientists trying to figure out uh, how to understand the virus, create a vaccine. Rats are used mostly. so. The year of the rat intertwining with all that's happening, not to mention that even memories of the plague are actually related to the rat. Um, so there's this whole um, way of having these dinners was a way to bring people together as if it's a potluck. So I would give you ingredients of what, what's good for the rabbit based on Chinese medicine that we researched, um, Ayurveda, because I, uh, Siddhartha is from India and his parents know about it, etc. He grew up with it. And then each, each animal has its main organ. Um, you can look up yours. So we looked into Western medicine to see what would be good or detoxing for that particular organ, for that particular sign. Amazingly, it all kind of matched up. So we came with some key ingredients and you would come to the table as a rabbit uh, with either what's recommended to you, a dish that you create or buy, whatever, however you come to the table, or rabbit cooked, in which case you're offering yourself. And then the whole cultural thing comes in because here people would be kind of grossed out about that. In France, it's considered a delicacy. And you see this in every animal around the wheel. Um, rats are gross to us to even think of this food, but there's many countries that actually eat wild rats from field rats. Um, if you think of the cow, it's a great example because uh, and in India, they're holy, and here they're totally used in industrial ways. It's like a factory, the way we're treating cows and ox, etc. So, so to to for you to come at the table, just to bring it back to that as an example, 
you also tell a story and then others around the table share their stories related to that animal. And we go in the circle, so it starts with the rat, ox, rabbit, and it keeps going. It's a very slow process, and it, it really allows for people to share. And each person becomes the center of the attention for that time, you know, 5, 10, 15 minutes, depending on how luxurious the dinner is. Some are really kind of fast lunches, meaning an hour, meaning fast. Um, in Vienna, we did like a record where it was four hours, and it, you can imagine Vienna. And Paris was also really slow and amazing. So it's it's very much about cultures. If you um, see the dinner in Paris, it's very different from um, Tokyo. It's very different from Taiwan. That particular one was in Vienna, uh, relatively recently, where I actually got access to a medical uh, facility where they gave me all the different bones of animals. So it's a table that's set up in a certain way. So this evolved and evolved and evolved and it got to the point where it was used as a performative uh, event. Here what you see is people sitting around the table are all either artists or administrators, director of the museum, everybody who is sitting around the table and going in the order of the zodiac and interpreting those ingredients in ways that are very different from, uh, let's say in Japan, the interpretations are very different. The stories are endless and it's really a great way to get community of people together. So now to shift it to the present moment, um, I got one of these memories on Facebook where, you know, it comes up and three years ago you did this and there was one of these dinners and I just wrote forward it and shared it and said, well, the good old days where we could sit and smell and share food. <laughs> like, I'm really sad. What am I supposed to do, a virtual dinner now? And I did it just to make fun. But I got all these people saying, yes, yes, please, let's do one. And I thought, what? how would that happen? But here's the thing. I started getting invitations and dipping into some of these um, events that are, people are sharing. So watch parties, cocktail parties, teas together, etc. And it gave me most of the time a very, very uneasy feeling because there's something unsympathetic about a lot of people that are in really terrible situations. Here we are, you know, in our beautiful house and we're safe and we have all the food and we're not worried about being unemployed. Let's have a cocktail party. It just seems like I can't do this. So for that reason, I actually started very much to consider how would this happen online. Back of my head, no particular plan until I saw the um, Earth Day being celebrated. And then I thought, now that would be really interesting if we could share meals or share in some way our experiences throughout the world and use the medium, right? So it's not just, oh, we do the dinners and show, but actually figure out what do you do with the background? What do you do with the sound? Bring in a bunch of artists who are my friends who would come up with super cool ideas. And, and then the whole thing was about time changes, like how do you deal with that? So what I decided that, and I talked to Siddharth and Monica, who's also working with this, um, hey, what do we do? I mean, it's getting, it's scaling. Many people want to do this, but you know, if it's in, in Japan, we're asleep, like what? you let go of control and you basically say 7 p.m. So it's 7 p.m. here, it's 7 p.m. somewhere else, somewhere else. And it would literally start in Australia, Asia, and then move until it kind of ends here. So in a funny way, it would start very close to China and then kind of move along the globe. 
we're experimenting. That's what we do. That's what we're good at. I'm totally happy to jump into the ocean. We're doing it very quickly, but the concept has been developed for so long that it's very much in place. It's really about now the interface and, and how to, how to, the, the artwork now becomes about how to organize it, how to pull it together so that it's not about the artist, but it's more about this network of people who are going to pay homage to the animals and give thanks to the animals and remind ourselves that we are animals. That's really the most important part. Then you think more of it globally, more of it in, in sense of where we are right now in relation to the rat and, for instance, the tiger. So what is the most binge watch show right now? Tiger King, right? I mean, this really weird, awful person that's just treating the animals in a way that after one episode, we just couldn't even watch. Um, and what happens last week, we get this news that in San Diego Zoo, uh, a tiger caught coronavirus. So to me, that's such a strong message. It's such a message from the wild. It's a message to the world. And then think about China and how it's being abused with superstition about Chinese medicine and the fact that they're trying to stop it, but the, med the habits and superstitions go so deep that there's gotta be other ways to help even Chinese uh, how to stop this practice. They want to because they see it's the source of a lot of problems, a lot of sickness, a lot of disease. But the way it's being looked at is very narrow. It doesn't look at it as an ecology, as this very complex system. And this is where artists are actually quite good at. We can, we can look at the big picture and then reduce it to something we understand. And to have it as a global event becomes critical because people say we're all in together. Yes, actually we are. And we, we can only solve this as a global community, yes. So let's do it. Let's really think that way. And the more there's of these events, the better. So if you do a search on Earth Day, which we did, obviously. Here and we then go. you look at the map, Earth Day Live, you will see the map of all the events that are going on. I think it's there. Somewhere under, keep going. Mm. Maybe it's not the map there. The, but, uh, the, register an event. Or maybe Earth Day 2020. Just go there. It's the first one. I okay. think it's there. It's wonderful. Um, keep, I think it's going. Yeah, there it is. There it is. So it's just, just the white bit should become. Just go map and it should show up. Um, maybe our internet's a little slow. But yeah, so this is earthday.org, Earth Day 2020. Yes. Uh, is the, uh, yeah. the web. Address. What you will see is this amazing amount of events going on uh, for the whole week, by the way. And if you do a Google search and you just put Earth Day in, uh, it's pages and pages and pages of events from children's events to environmentalism to uh, scientific lectures unreal and it just gives me hope I just feel this is amazing and it really should be going on and on and on especially during this time that we're quarantined and we're like animals in our little zoos um, some posh some horrible we should have this sense of being planetary citizens of being really in it all together and how do we go to the next step without going to business as usual this really has to make us very proactive right now. I, I feel really strongly about that. I've changed all my classes to be about this situation through the filter of this, but not to to think about it as like, oh, this is horrible, we got enough of that, but to think about how do we make alternatives? How do we envision a different way in a logical way, not utopian, totally being aware of this 20% unemployment. All of this is destroyed. There's people who are sick. There's people who don't have insurance. There's problems with animals. How do you envision to slowly shift it 
to another world that's more forgiving, that's more empathetic. Everything negative is showing for us to see, but not to continue that way. And it seems like that's what a lot of the leadership around the world, I should say, we're probably the first, uh, but around the world, people have been left on their own, which you could also say, oh, that's horrible, but no, it's good because it's grassroots, it's community, global community coming together. And I, I should say that um, backtrack to the project, we also decided to let people speak in their own language. So then you know, if you're in Portugal, you introduce yourself with your name and the animal you are in English so that others know. But then the rest of us can look at the food and the people around the table and still appreciate it, even if we don't understand the language. And, and it really restricts people if it's their second language. It restricts people also to participate. So if you just say, oh no, you can speak French, especially the French. <laughs> They're like, oh, okay, we're going. <laughs> so in this is in this day and age, I actually water things down. I'm a I'm a creator myself, so I water things down to either create or destroy. I find that with myself or most people, if you're not being creative, you're usually self-destructive or whatever else. And you know, I, I think Voltaire said every act of creation is an act of destruction. Sometimes every act of destruction is an act of creation. It's the opposite, meaning that uh, in this time, we, us finally having quiet time to mentally go inside because we can't go outside, suddenly people are melting down. They're like in that uh, cocoon of the, uh, the caterpillar, and we don't even know what butterfly is going to come out of this, what the new creation is going to come out. And so the caterpillar can't even imagine what the butterfly is going to be. And so it, we're actually all melting down mentally, physically, and spiritually. We're challenging ourselves. And so all of your, this event isn't to be taken lightly because it forces people to look inside, look at the zodiac, look at the relationship with the world, look and do some education, learn some new things, and, and consider the possibilities of how your little piece fits into the whole. Mm -hmm. Is there any, anything that I missed on that, <laughs> you know? No, you didn't, but it, it brings me back to a piece that I did with my partner, Jim Jimjewski, the Blue Morph which I, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but basically we were looking and Jim actually measured the metamorphosis of a chrysalis into a butterfly. And we, rec we accelerated and recorded that sound. So the vibrations of metamorphosis were what was being recorded. It was uh, sped up and amplified so we could hear it. Um, and then we uh, imaged the wings, we combined this, and we had people sitting in these sounds of metamorphosis. Now guess what? This was 2008, which is when the big crash happened. And the, the vibrations were like this, up and down, up and down. So one of the things that made us amazed, both of us, is the fact that metamorphosis does, actually does not happen it does not happen gradually. It happens in the big bursts. So it bursts up, it comes down. It bursts up, it comes down. Like what's happening with the the market right now, the Wall Street market. It's just going up and down, up and down. That's a clear sign that there's some kind of metamorphosis going on. And it was amazing to actually think about how this change happens drastically. But we build up to it, right? So it's also this moment that suddenly flips and one, one virus that's 140 plus minus nanometers can make the whole planet stop everywhere. A, it's just stopped us all. And it's an opportunity to think about where we're going from here, like you said, exactly. Or we don't learn the lesson Obviously, we didn't learn it in 2008. 10, 10, 12 years later, full circle, we are here having that same opportunity. And we'll see. I mean, I think it's a bit different this time because it's in the entire planet. 
uh, normally, you know, influenza or SARS or MERS is somewhere else and we somehow control that it doesn't come here. Now it's everywhere. And if you want to go to back to business as normal, you can't because we can not travel the way we did. New travel has to be invented. We can't eat the way we did. New ways of eating needs to happen. All of that. And, and these kind of situations actually from the pressure create innovation. And you can see this from many extreme situations of destruction, what you're saying. So that destruction and creation together goes hand in hand. What you're looking at now actually is um, in, at the Governor's Island in New York. Um, I installed the blue marker there. And what you see is this uh, hat that's actually a meteorological balloon with a net. And the person sits on this interactive seat where you hear the actual signs of vibrations processed. And you see the microscopic images of the wing. So you're meditating. You're, you're in the space where you're actually meditating on metamorphosis. And this brings me back to your question about, well, what now? It's really a challenge for me. You asked about challenges, a challenge that I welcome. How do I take some of these works that were really effective, but still were limited to the audience that experienced them, even if it was so many people, to, to creating some kind of meditation portals that are online to to have people put their earphones in create spatialized sound 3d imagery maybe ar augmented reality where you could really get into this world that's not so new agey like putting you into another state as much as what you just said like confronting some of these complexities that are individual and also social and but not in a way where it's bombarding you but where it's kind of taking you through a story that's abstract it's not telling you a story it's how you experience it it's a challenge but i'm very interested in that because i think it's got great potential and i think a lot of a lot of the arts will go in that direction i'm pretty sure music sound vibrations colors a lot of what the meditation world was doing in a way, but it, it had a certain aesthetic and a way that I always felt was not enough to me uh, because I never wanted to fit into a particular lineage. I would take things from different lineages, but never commit to one because I committed to my own path. It's uneasy and uncertain. and I don't know where I'm going and I prefer to be there. I agree. I agree. So meditation is like juggling. Um, you can always add another ball. It's like math. You can always add another zero. There's always more to learn. And, and when you quiet your mind, you connect to your spirit. You connect to your soul. You let this connect to your body as opposed to thinking everything. You get to feel things. And as an artist, you, you very well know that the feeling or the feminine attributes of love and kindness and compassion and whatever are sometimes what leads you to the really amazing insights that when you finally quiet the mind enough that you can listen to your spirit, suddenly you get new insight. That's where art really comes from sometimes. And so... Uh, we're doing that right now. Most people, uh, you know, all of our busy rat race that we've been in, we're quiet enough now that people are, are actually online learning new things, having new experiences. So this is timely because you're challenging them to have new experiences mentally, physically, and spiritually and connect to a place of creativity and intuition and love, right? The other challenge on the flip side of that is that very quickly it became a lot of noise. So very quickly we find ourselves too many hours on Zoom, too many things going on, too many things to choose from. So the other challenge is also how do you 
pull it in where it becomes like a different type of experience. Like you are going to quote unquote museum or you are going to a temple or you're going to a place where you want to get that experience. The binaural music stuff a little bit. You know, you could go into that mode, uh, but not as a full kind of immersive visual sound experience. Um, so how, how to make sure that also the opportunity doesn't get lost because there's so many good artists and musicians and sound artists who could just do amazing stuff right now. Um, we have to really not sit on our butt, you know, just absorbing all the different things, but try to not lose the opportunity to have the medium before the big corporations come in and just squash it with all the stuff, you know. I mean, some is good, some is bad, but it's, it becomes very dominant. And that happened in my lifetime with the cable TV where when it initially came out, I was doing video art and we were just so excited. Thought, wow, amazing. Very quickly, it just like got squashed and disappeared. So we were more um, showing the possibilities of it, but in the end, the big companies just took over. When the internet first started, I was very, very active in the net art community and it was such an amazing possibility. And then again, it just, the noise came in. So again, it's this, crossroads we're in, what kind of media do we want? And people should just stop watching things that crap and you know, just move their attention to some other way, another experience. And if I'm if I'm on Zoom and meetings, 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 I get exhausted. But if you tell me, hey, there's this concert, there's this person doing some interesting thing, it doesn't exhaust me. It, it's this other experience. So more of that as soon as possible. So in our society right now, they've shut down the small businesses and they've kept open the big businesses. Same thing. You okay. can go to Walmart and be six feet away, but you can't go to the ocean. You can't go have a yoga class you know, six feet away from someone, but you can uh, you, you know, you can go to Walmart and, and stand in line. It's, 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 it's so weird that these rules promote, once again, big business. And then now everybody's ordering online and supporting Amazon. Like, he makes like $35 billion a day or some insane amount of money like this. Jeff Bezos. Yeah. And so at some point, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. We make these rules, and who makes the rules? So what I'm looking into is... All those artists that are just the small little artists or the little businesses, we have to support them. They're the ones that support the local little league team. They're the ones that, that give your kids really new opportunities for playing music or uh, whatever it is. That's the society. That's the community. And ordering online as opposed to going down to the corner and getting something from the local store is actually doing yourself and society a disservice. And then same thing with supporting artists. If you just buy online and Amazon and whatever and get your download or get your thing from, from the big brother, we should be doing it directly from the artist. We should be supporting the artist and bringing everybody together because that's our society. That's community. Yeah. And it's really important to look into very quickly also to new economic systems for artists. So I'm, I'm also very much thinking about that because of all these young artists, where are they going to go? You know, it's, it's too, too much. It, yeah, it's, it's a problem. I mean, speaking of Bezos, I feel if he's worth a trillion, which is practically a third world country, right? Um, where is he? Like, mm -hmm. he could save some, like, where is all that money going? So how do we also influence these people to be more uh, empathetic and maybe art can do it? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I totally agree. That's what a lot of my talks end up getting into, which is, uh, I believe that the feminine, the divine feminine is actually the leader. And that uh, 
the old way was this, you know, masculine way of like a leader, and then everybody's watching the watching the leader as the followers, and they're the sheep. Well, the new way is is a feminine way, and it, like the grandmothers would do, is a circle instead of me, 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 watch me and my ego mind. Instead, it's we. It's this heart. It's this intuition. It's a circle, and and that everybody's in a circle. Everybody's equal and on the same same level. And everybody's heard. You you pass a talking stick. Everybody's been heard, and everybody's connected. And you come to consensus as what's good for all for we. And so, as community, we we the people have to take our power back. And not just in the United States. Everywhere around the planet, if you look, everybody's sick and tired of being sick and tired. We're sick of the rich getting richer and the poor getting poor. It's almost like the monopoly board. Is has been sitting there, and one guy's got all the money, and the other ten players are like, "Well, I'm bored with the game. This is stupid." And you just want to topple over the board and start over. Well, if you if you look into money, fractional reserve banking, the the uh, you know the World Bank and Federal Reserve, and some of the Ponzi schemes set up by the richest few, money itself is useless. It's it's a agreed on paper. That we that's got no more value than monopoly money, and so when we all finally get sick and tired of being sick and tired, and we don't go to their system but create our own, then we might take our power back. Because true true money is supposed to be appreciative. Well, we can appreciate right now our local community, our local artists by buying their CD, by buying by you know uh, CD Baby used to be a, a company that artists went to. It got bought out by Amazon, and they shut down all distribution now. Oh, we can't distribute your local CD. We can only do the big artist, and they just did that in the past couple of weeks. Look into it; it's crazy. So artists have to now shuffle and look for a new way to get their music out or their art out or whatever. And so we, the people, have to come together and take back our power, unify. You know. All right. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good ending. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for for all your thing. What is what is our instructions for this coming Wednesday on uh, on uh, April twenty second on Earth Day? I will send you a link. But basically, you create a dinner uh, if you want to host uh, at seven p.m. So you join everybody around the world, or you join one, and there will be a page where you can join, or just you and just enjoy watching people <laughs> so at any level you'll be able to connect and just be grateful to animals and remind yourself that you're an animal perfect perfect well thank you so much for a beautiful day i hope you have an incredible rest of your day and I'll, i will uh, certainly love to share this here in the next uh, in the next 24 hours so thank, thank you so much thanks so much okay. thank blessings you. all right bye-bye